Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. This is Cairo, the biggest and busiest city in all of the Middle East. But it's also the street food capital of Egypt. And a culinary world I can't wait to discover. I love Middle Eastern food, but I do know I've still got a lot to learn. Wow, they are sweet, aren't they? So I'm on a journey through bustling cities and lush farmland. And from glittering coastlines to harsh desert landscapes. If the scorpions or the snakes come, you can see they've been here already. To discover how so many communities have thrived here. 400 breads a day. Yes, you guys are busy. I'll be shown familiar favourites. It's never too late to learn how to make hummus. And sample new flavours. It's like the best kebab I've ever eaten in my life. And I'll be using that inspiration in dishes of my own. Well done, me. This time, my skills as a critic are tested to the limits. I'm not quite sure. I think I'll have to eat a little bit more. <laughs> I sing for my supper. Oh, should we sing a song? No. No? No. And I make a meal that's perfect for sharing. It's when you ask your auntie Joan around and you know that she's going to get parsley stuck in her teeth. Often referred to as the cradle of civilization, Egypt is a giant of the Middle East, spanning the northeast corner of Africa and stretching into the southwest corner of Asia. Close to 20 million people call Cairo their home, and on the outskirts of the city, the ancient monuments of Giza stand proudly, just as they did when they were built a staggering four and a half thousand years ago. Unlike its neighboring Middle Eastern capitals, Cairo doesn't have such a thriving restaurant culture, so it's on the streets that I plan to find the finest foods. To guide me on my quest, I'm meeting Layla, who runs food tours of Cairo. Hi, John. How are you? It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. You have the most extraordinary city. Yes, welcome to Cairo. If you're in for street food, you've come to the right place. I absolutely love street food. I think for me, street food is that it's sort of the heartbeat of a culture. You get to see the street food, where people really eat. This is my favourite thing to do. Yes. Eat and, and explore. Yeah. Speaking of which, it's beautiful. Yeah. What is this place? So this is an authentic small old bakery. These bakeries only do Beledi bread. Beledi? Yes. And Beledi means local. I've seen bread like this all around Cairo. Yeah. But how do they make it? We can take a look inside and you know you can see the process from start to finish. Show me the way. Right. Whoa, what a place. So the word for bread is Aish in Arabic, and Aish actually means life or comes from the word of life. This is really what bread is to Egyptians, you know. They are so, so beautiful. So you got the whole process here, it's like a mini factory, you know, you've got Everything from mixing the dough to flattening out, putting all the ingredients together to actually baking it in the oven. You've got these beautiful old ovens. This is super traditional, very authentic. If they press in the wrong spot, exactly in the middle rather than around it, the bread would basically collapse. And then they would sell that bread cheaper. It would still taste good, but they would sell it cheaper. I've just realized what I've been doing wrong to my flatbread. <laughs> By you just saying that, yeah. it makes sense. Yeah. You've got to press around the outside, exactly. seal the edges, let the air come in the middle, exactly. and the whole thing will puff up. I think it's the most, one of the most stunning things I've ever seen. Yeah. In, out, up, down, all around. Yep. The extraordinary production line. There's a sort of bit of magic and ballet and dance going on. Can I take one of these? Can I? Yes, take one of these. It? it is as light as a feather and it's <laughs> soft, but there inside is air. Mm. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Can we open that up? Yes, do it. Can I try some? Yeah, try some. Mm. There's not a lot of flavour to it. No. Can I sit my head in that oven and just have a look? Please because don't do that. No, I'm not going to sit my head in the oven, but I want to have a look. Is that all right? Yeah. It look. runs very, very deep inside. Oh, Sorry. my goodness. <laughs> and they puff up 
they're like, they're like lanterns. They almost look like they look real, like bits of crepe paper. Yeah. yeah. Let me tell you something. It's hot in here. I mean, not a little bit hot. I mean, hotter than hot on a hot day on Hot Island. And these guys are just doing this over and over and over and over. Oh, I was just question. Oh, OK, OK, I'm out the way. Oh, OK, I'm out the way. Right, time to get out of here. That's the original food delivery service. Yeah, yeah. He even got a high five on the way out. I mean, that is incredible. This place is extraordinary. Time to see where my cyclist friends take their thousands of baladi breads. What is it? This is my personal favourite dish, and it's called hawaoshi. 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 So it's ha wow shi. Hawaoshi. And it's going to be that good. So tell me the process. How does this work? What, what goes on? So you take a piece of bread, a full one. You stuff it with minced beef that is actually raw. Right. You cook it the first time. That's what they're doing here. That's exactly what they're doing. Once this is done cooking, you take it out, you fill it up with cheese, veggies, anything you want basically. And then you put it back in to crisp up the bread and get, you know, you put ghee all over it to get it to get crispy. And then you've got this delicious, you know, flavor bomb. Can we stop the temptation? Can we actually eat some? Yes. Shukran. It's very, very, very hot. So watch your fingers because you're probably going to burn them. Now, the thing is, I'm not quite sure. I think I'll have to eat a little bit more. This is like a cross between a toasted cheese sandwich, a burger, a meatloaf, salad, a crispy pizza all in one. Imagine all the best things you've ever had as a takeaway and put it into one sandwich. How do you top that as far as street food goes in Cairo? Honestly, I don't think you can ever top that. Is the best food in Cairo always on the streets? The best food is eaten on the street, but there are still some things you got to try at home. Where do we go to now? Well, let's just keep it a surprise. A surprise? Yes, because I, I know you're going to love it. I love a surprise. <laughs> surprise in Cairo. suburbia? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's true. Layla's brought me to the suburbs to sample a local delicacy. I brought you here to try a classic Egyptian dish called hamem mahshi, or stuffed pigeon. I talked to my friend's mom, and she makes the best hamem mahshi. I've got somebody's mum teaching me how to make a classic yes. Egyptian dish. Yes, exactly. This is the sort of stuff I love. It's going to be awesome. Is it? Let's do it. Awesome. Let's do <laughs> it. <laughs> John, this is nice to meet you. Abia is going to show me how she makes her Egyptian stuffed pigeon. Right. I'm just going to tell you right now, we don't speak the same language, so I'm just going to try as hard as I can. Abia adds two spoonfuls of black pepper and a teaspoon of ground cardamom into a pot of water. Then dices some onions in a blender. OK, so that onions are going into a pot. That's ghee. Onions and butter. So these here are all the insides of the pigeon. In here, there's the hearts and the gizzards and everything else. Obviously, I'm slowing her down, so she's coming to take them away from me. She's coming to take them away. Flavour is obviously really important. Onions and butter, and now the hearts and the gizzards of the pigeon into the pot. That's the base flavour. That's some more black pepper. Not an insignificant amount. Cinnamon? Uh, cinnamon. Whoa, look at that, turmeric, lots of it. Yes, garlic powder. It says garlic on the outside of the jar, that's how I know. <laughs> Salt, yeah. And then... Mmm, the rice is being washed. Rice is going in. Hot on mayo? Hot on mayo. Mayo is water. That will simmer on the hob while we get our hands dirty. Time to prepare the pigeon. Clean the inside out, and then take the head away. Just think, these things this morning could have been flying around Trafalgar Square. These are the livers now. The livers are going in with the rice. Okay. It's all very, very clean, and look at the size of them. They're really lovely and small, and there is beautiful flesh here on the, on the actual breast and I'm fascinated by this stuffing. 
As a kid, my grandmother always stuffed a chicken, roast chicken, lots and lots of stuffing, because chicken was for special occasions, and the stuffing meant they could feed the whole family. One chicken could feed 20 of us. For my cat. For your cats? Yeah. Oh, they get the best bits. But they have used everything. I mean, the thing is, everything's being used. The pigeon, the inside of the pigeon, the livers, the gizzards, the hearts, all in with the eyes. And I suppose the feathers to make a pillow. Just joking. The rice is only half cooked. And the reason it needs to be half cooked is because it's going to become a stuffing. And the stuffing, when it's inside, the cavity needs to swell up and fill the whole bird and take on all the juices. Here in Egypt, pigeon is on the menus everywhere. It's a proper delicacy. Stick the legs through the back of it. We've got a little production line going here. I'm doing the big end, and Abir's doing the neck end. Stock is brought to the boil. Stuff pigeons straight into the water. Here we go. And the pigeons go in. OK, so now we wait. And should we sing a song? La, 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 la. <laughs> no? No. No good? No. OK. <laughs> One day I'm going to find somebody who'll sing with me. Fifteen awkward minutes later, out come the pigeons. And it's time to get arty. So what's this? Tomato sauce. Yes, tomato sauce. And lemon. Uh-huh. Oil, pepper. Uh-huh. Uh, salt. Your English is amazing. Thank you. And what happens to that? That's how you paint a pigeon. OK, so it's going into a cold oven, and then she's going to turn the oven up. Abia carefully arranges the rice that wasn't used for the stuffing onto our plates. And out of the oven come our painted pigeons. They look great! That's how you cook a pigeon, Egyptian style. Haman mushy. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the pigeon party. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me in your home. Abia, shukran. Welcome. The question is, how do we eat it? Oh. <laughs> yes. Take it apart. Oh, there it goes. Ah. Oh. Oh. Just play it, Mum. There we are. Wow. Oh. Oh, amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Leila, I love that people, you know, pull their food apart and feel it. Mm. Mm, well, well. Your mum still takes it apart for you? Yeah. Of course she does. <laughs> does your mum still do your washing? No, she doesn't. <laughs> <Sometimes. Okay. laughs> <laughs> this family has been so generous. The food is delicious, but it's soft and subtle, subtle with spice. The rice is beautifully flavoured with a little bit of turmeric and some garlic, uh, a little bit of cumin and coriander, and, and this tomato sweetness across the top of the pigeon skin brings it all alive. The pigeon's soft, the whole thing is wonderful. As they say in Egypt, El Fahana. <laughs> 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 The sun is rising on the city again, and surprise, surprise, I've woken up hungry. And what I do know is that one of my favourite foods won't be hard to find around here. I'm here to find out about a food that I have loved since I was a kid. It's found in different versions all the way through the Middle East, and it's a must-have when you come to Egypt. It is falafel. I've eaten falafel all over the world, but it's widely claimed that it was invented here in Egypt a thousand years ago when the Coptic Christians gave up meat for Lent. Sabari al khair. How are you? How are you? Qahira bimu ala ta'amir. Ah. OK, it seems like falafel for all of everywhere else, but in Cairo especially, it's tamir. Here we go. There's the beans. There's a surprise. Many of us think falafel and chickpeas, but here, it's just fava beans. Okay. So here, there's herbs, parsley, looks like rocket, mint. Then he adds garlic, cumin seeds, and fennel seeds. And so the last bit is some salt. The salt acts as abrasive and it breaks the whole thing down to make a paste. Five minutes, ten minutes? Five. 
Five minutes. It's vibrant green. It smells quite incredible. And I am in my element. He said he's finished this bit, but actually we've still got to cook it. And then I get to eat it. To the cooker we go. Here we go. Right now, Ahmed has got a bowl of falafel mix. His hand is touching a mixture of coriander seed and a herb, patting the top, taking a piece out, and then going inside. You can smell the garlic and the herbs as it cooks. I've learned how to make falafel. I've learned how to cook it and add these little bits of spices. One thing to do, and that's eat it. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. I took a massive greedy mouthful, and for good reason. The smell is intoxicating. It's moist, it's green, it tastes of herbs, it's sweet, it's savoury, it's got spice across the top of it. The bread is soft. It is a piece of art. Is it the best I've ever had? I think it may be. I'm always happier with a belly full of falafel. And that's a belly. I've tasted so many delicious things here in Cairo, but now I'm off to Giza because I plan to prepare a Middle Eastern classic in the most incredible surroundings. I'm going to make my version of kufta and tabbouleh in the shadows of the pyramids of Giza. Kufta are just a delicious little meat patty which are cooked over coals on a skewer. In here, I've got some minced beef with a little bit of extra fat, and the reason the fat is because when it cooks, I want it to stay lovely and moist. So to that, I'm going to add a mixture of my ground roasted spices, cardamom pods and coriander seeds. Now to that, good pinch of salt and a really good pinch of pepper. Here's the secret. A little tiny splash of water just to keep that meat wonderful and moist. Splash. A good splash of lemon juice. And to that, fresh chopped mint. A little bit of garlic. Garlic goes in and so does the mint give it a really good mix together. Wooden skewers, which I've soaked in water. If you soak in water, it's easier for the meat to come off when it's cooked. The other thing is, when they're over the coals, they don't burn. Take a bit of mixture, about a spoonful or a forkful, roll it into a ball, flatten the patty, and then take your skewer and literally wrap it around the outside of it. Make enough for a decent feast. This is all about the charcoal. And they just simply get laid across the top. As the kuf to cook, I'm going to make a tabbouleh. Borgel wheat soaked for about 20 minutes in cold water. Parsley. Don't be shy with the parsley. And some tomato. Chop the parsley brutally. It is all about parsley. It's when you ask your auntie Joan around and you know that she's going to get parsley stuck in her teeth. That lovely parsley smile that we all love at a barbie. In it goes. To that, that borgle. Soaked and then drained. And every so often, just check your kufta, make sure they're OK. Just gently turn them over. Look at that, all lovely. Chopped onion. Take your tomatoes. Cut them into quarters, long ways. Over the tomatoes, a little sprinkling of salt. And let them sit. Because my kufta are ready to come off. A bread is not just used for a sandwich or to be used with something inside it. It's also used as a plate. I'm simply going to take them off and place them on top of that piece of bread. And then all the juice from those will slowly but surely soak into the bread. And now to finish off the salad. Be a bit butch with it. Give it a good chop. And now just a tiny touch of olive oil. Just mix it all together. And now take that juice and all those tomatoes and scrape it all in. To that, some lemon juice. Good sprinkling of black pepper. 
As I've travelled around, I duck into markets, go to souks, you know, hang out a little bit, try and be cool in Egypt, and pick up a few spices. And I've got here za'atar. Thyme, oregano, marjoram. Oh, there's so much debate about what it is, where it comes from. Did it come from the Romans? Did it come from the Greeks? Did it come from the Egyptians? We're not quite sure. But where it's going to is into my tabbouleh. And now a bit of a mix. Really mix it together. The parsley is the hero. Lemon and grilled meat go together really well for two reasons. The sharp acid in the lime or lemon bring out the flavour, but also that acid helps you digest the fattiness of the meat. Take the bread and put it on your board. A good spoonful of your tabbouleh. This is not for the faint-hearted. This is about sharing. This is about family. This is about offering it up to everybody who you love. Take the wonderful bits of kufta that are here and place them across the top. A bit more lime across the top. And there we have it, kufta with tabbouleh in the shadow of the pyramids. My time in Cairo has been one of life's truly extraordinary experiences. I've learned how to make falafel. I've been blown away by the bread. I've eaten stuffed pigeon in somebody's home and I've toured the extraordinary streets of the city and eaten the food. And I've even cooked in front of the pyramids.